Hello, my name is Ellen Wagner. Um, I'm the interim director at the Adolescent Health Initiative and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, thank you for joining us for a follow-up question and answer session from our 2021 conference on adolescent health. Um, I'm joined today by Dr. Winner who presented on mental health practice with immigrant and refugee youth at the event. Um, and we are gonna continue our Q and A with him now as we had so many questions at the event. Um, so Jeffrey P. Win Winner, PhD, is an attending psychologist within the Trauma and Community Resilience Center at Boston Children's Hospital and an instructor of psychology at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Winner's work is primarily focused on developing, disseminating, and implementing culturally responsive and trauma-informed psychological interventions for youth and families of refugee and immigrant backgrounds. The values of equity, anti-racism, and structural system change are at the center of this work. He is the recipient of the Thrasher Research Fund Early Career Award and is co-author of Mental Health Practice with Immigrant and Refugee Youth, published by the American Psychological Association. Outside of his work at Boston Children's Hospital, he continues to work at the McLean Hospital 3 East Adolescent DBT Partial Hospital Program, and maintains a private practice. For more information, you can visit drjeffwinner.com. So there are a few questions, as I mentioned, we weren't able to get to at the event. And so we're now gonna hold some space um, for Dr. Winner to answer those. So thank you again, Dr. Winner, for your time and, and sure, making um, this continued Q&A happen. Yeah, of course. All right, well, we can dive in. So the first question here is, how do you make arrangements for a translator and what if translation is not possible? Uh, yeah, so a great question. So maybe a, a couple of pieces. So uh, first, just in terms of language, when people are using the, so there's the term translate, translator or translation and then interpreter and interpretation. And so often when people are using the word translator or translation, that's often for the, the technical definition is really for text-based um, language. So someone is translating text written in one language into another. An interpreter um, is someone who is doing often simultaneous language-based, like spoken um, language to language. Um, and so that again, translator or translation is often for text, interpreter or interpretation is often for spoken. So often in the context of healthcare service delivery, often people are talking about trying to find an interpreter, although there are times where we also need translation of documents. So finding translation or having translation for documents like informed consent documents or different types of HIPAA or healthcare information is really important. So that way folks can understand um, in a language that they feel comfortable with. Um, for interpretation, again, it's often working with a healthcare interpreter or a cultural broker or someone like that. Um, with regard to that previous piece around translation, for some of the communities that folks are trying to serve who have um, had significant either educational disruption or have um, experienced forced displacement, folks may have not had the luxury or opportunity to learn how to read or write in their native language. And so it's important not to assume that um, someone has that has had that luxury. And so being mindful about that when you're trying to figure out how do I communicate information or on a legal side, how do I get someone or obtain a signature from someone for material? And many hospitals or university systems or community clinics have um, suggestions or guidance sort of based on their state specific laws and then local resources and then whether or not it's using insurance. So that's just one sort of related piece. Uh, everyone uh, deserves a right to have healthcare services delivered in a language um, and, and in a cultural context that they can understand and, and receive. Um, I'd say a really important piece is uh, it's our responsibility as healthcare providers or educators to, to try to facilitate that. It doesn't mean that it's always easy. Um, if you're lucky that you have someone who speaks that language who's on staff, that's the easiest thing. However, for programs, particularly folks where they're building their capacity to serve refugee and immigrant communities. They need, may need to be working with outside um, agencies or groups. There are multiple companies that have phone-based interpreter services that you can sort of contract with individually. Um, and then most hospital, larger hospitals or university systems have an interpreter services. So it's really, if you're sort of entering into this work, it's trying to think, 
what are the current capacities of my organization? You know, what can we do? Um, that's the first thing. Second is what, what's my legal obligation um, in order to provide this service? And then three is like, how are we going to figure out how to pay for it or fund it? Some of these things can be covered uh, based on the mechanism by insurance or by other um, infrastructure within the clinic or system. Sometimes your people are funding it through um, other sort of philanthropic supports. Um, but try to think how do I how do I sustain and support this work and then and make sure that the interpreter, um, which is may often be a, a member of the community that you're also trying to serve, uh, is compensated for their time. So we really don't want to be in a position where a provider is unfairly leveraging the skills, expertise, and wisdom of someone to be able to provide their service and then that they're not compensated. So we also want, really want to make sure those folks are, are compensated. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Ellen, can you remind me the second, the, the second question? I may have already answered it. Yes. So it was two parts, as you said. The first, how do you make arrangements for a translator or interpreter? And then mm -hmm. what if translation or interpretation is not possible? Yeah, and that's a great, and so folks may come into the situation where they were doing their best and then are in a clinical encounter where they don't have an interpreter um, available. One common, uh, when we're working with kids and families is that folks are utilizing a family member to do that interpretation. And that's really strongly not advised. So again, not advised to do that. Um, and part of, there's a lot of reasons why we don't want that to happen. Now, there are maybe certain little moments where it's, I mean, I'm trying to talk to mom, they're walking out the door, I want to make sure that she knows that the appointment's at 4 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. next week. These very small things, in my personal perspective, those are maybe less problematic. You know, the interpreter's already gone home, how do I make sure that, you know, that's something you can um, say it to the 10-year-old. to the ten -year -old. But for things where you're delivering a healthcare service, you really want to be working with someone who is not in that family system, uh, who's not a child uh, and doing that work. Because again, that person is a conduit for that service. And if it's a mental health service delivery, you talk about a lot of different things and that's passing through that kid um, in the same way that you wouldn't have a kid take a medicine and then spit out that medicine and then give it to their parent. Um, we wanna make sure that that kid stays safe in that context while also acknowledging the reality of, of these things. Another important layer to consider is if you're working with the community uh, if you're in a context where there's a relatively small population of a particular ethnocultural community, it's very possible that the interpreter that you hire or contract with may be connected in some way with the family you're trying to serve. And so working collaboratively with your team, with supervision, with members of the community you're trying to serve to try to navigate that. Things like being really clear about confidentiality and then being really clear again around the pros and cons of trying to make sure you deliver the service to the family while also attending to the, their needs and the laws of that system. Um, and this is in our, in, our, in our model, Trauma Systems Therapy for Refugees, often we're really sort of promoting the idea of working with cultural brokers as opposed to sort of um, tra only traditional mental health interpreters because cultural brokers are folks who are members of the community and have both cultural knowledge and um, expertise of how to sort of deliver mental health services. If I may ask my my own follow up question about sure, this, yeah. what are some considerations for um, a scenario where you, um, a young person, you may not have interpreter services available or easily available, or it would be an extra obstacle to get in services, and a young person does have some proficiency in English but is requesting an interpreter? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I've had. Um, sometimes you can work with an interpreter or cultural broker, not um, in a context where you're not you know, doing every single word, but they're sort of in the session with you, providing support sort of as needed. So, and that's really, again, depends on the particular program, probably the particular state and the particular mechanism by which that provider is supported. So if it's a healthcare or medical interpreter, often their mandate is to interpret word for word. And so it's working with that provider. Oh, actually, we want you here. And maybe I'll answer your question sort of for support as, as indicated, or uh, this, this child or this young person actually would prefer to do therapy with an interpreter, even though they have some proficiency in English. And so for in my perspective, if I was the provider, it's really trying to understand what is the child, you know, or patient or client students perspective and what helps them 
um, engage with the service in a way that feels most authentic and affirming, and then trying to, to put, put the pieces together so that can happen. So um, it may be that they really want to do the service in the language that the provider was speaking. They, you know, if it was, it was me trying to want to do it in English or maybe in a different language. So again, just really biasing towards what does the youth um, and or youth and family, um, what will be most helpful for them? And then navigating from there. All right, I have one more follow-up question sure. about this. Um, this is bringing up a lot of things for me. What about a scenario where you have an interpreter um, who may on its surface speak the same language as the young person, but perhaps there's some kind of miscommunication either because of a dialect or some other cultural reason. Um, and you're having some questions about, about that, about what's going on there. Has yeah, that come up so for you before? Yes, that has that type of situation has happened for me as a provider and me, a super, uh, supervisor and me as sort of consulting on things. I think the, the sort of the, what can, what can you do ahead of time? So to sort of be proactive, if you're working with someone and you're saying, oh, we're going to be providing the service in Arabic and then trying to check in with that provider about any dialect specific expertise or um, content that they have and then the, the context or culture uh, of the person you're trying to serve because there may be, you know, variability. Um, and again, different languages have different, have different spread in terms of those types of things, you know, but, but cultural nuance or, or region specific dialect is, is not uncommon. Um, so that's sort of preparing ahead of time. And maybe you've done that or, or didn't have the opportunity to do that. Then you're in the moment. I think trying to slow down conversations and meta communicate with the interpreter or provider as much as possible. If there's a context, if you're worried things are, if you're getting a feeling in your stomach, for example, that like something isn't going quite right, trying to take a pause and either checking with, depending on the material, checking with that other interpreter um, in the moment or taking a quick pause and stepping out, again, depending on the material to check in together and then making a decision from there. Of like, are we able to deliver you know, again, in mental service delivery, it's like, it's, it's all going through that person. And so are we able to do what we need to do? Or is this causing more harm than good? Or how do I pivot? So that way we're most effective. And you're also simultaneously navigating a relationship with the other provider, with the interpreter and, and sort of their own thoughts and feelings. And so you've got to be sort of navigating a couple of things. Um, there's a real, a, a major skill, you know, being an interpreter is an incredibly complicated and hard job. And then doing mental health, um, sort of interpretation is another layer. Um, my colleague, Dr. Alicia Miller and, and others um, from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network built out um, some really great resources related to mental health interpretation um, that folks can find online um, if people are interested. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, our next question, if you're ready, is a big one. What made you do what you do? Me personally? I would venture to say yes, personally. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think, I mean, for me, I, um, the two main topics that have, in terms of things that I've wanted to participate in for, for most of my life, I was privileged in that I had, I was really interested in, in uh, sort of child, adolescent, uh, family, mental health, since I was maybe in high school. Um, I'd worked at a crisis hotline as a teenager, but both my parents are healthcare providers and um, was really interested, I like working with kids. And so I was really interested in that, that domain. Uh, and then also started sort of as a teenager, really interested in social justice equity. Um, I didn't know the term anti-racism at the time in high school, but those, the types of ideas around uh, structural oppression and being a, a white man in a you know, suburban context, how can I participate in some of these, in some of these ideas? And, for me, over my journey through high school, college, grad school, whatnot, uh, refugee and immigrant mental health was a place where I could participate in both of those, those areas. And so that's, um, I felt fortunate to be able to continue to contribute or try to participate and learn in those areas. Uh, and I, so that's sort of the, I guess, sort of intellectual side or academic side. And then, you know, for, for some of the kids or communities that we're trying to support, you know, folks who've experienced uh, humanitarian displacement, you know, things that no, no person should have to navigate. And, you know, for me, I, I grew up in a context where based on my particular lottery ticket in life, you know, born in the eighties in suburban East coast, 
Um, I didn't have to connect, contend with some of these challenges, whereas based on my identity and histories, if I was born in, you know, late 30s, early 40s in, in parts of Europe, you know, my family may have been refugees or I may not uh, be in the same kind of context. And so, you know, folks who are of, of a refugee and immigrant background, forced displacement is often just based on some aspect of an experience that they may not have had a lot of agency over. Thank you. The next question is, are there physical activities that help gain confidence and stability, help, um, I'm gonna rephrase this a little bit. Um, so are there any physical activities um, that can help immigrant youth in high school gain confidence and stability? So physical activities, <clears throat> so, you know, I think it, it could be a big range there. You know, we know, um, uh, regular physical activity um, is um, excellent for psychological well-being, and if there are interventions that we could do, I've heard this from a lot of different psychologists over the years. You know, if we could come up with strategies to help facilitate regular healthy exercise, you know, for most youth, we would likely see you know a noticeable you know mental health increase, you know, epidemiologically or sort of globally. Um, for me, there maybe there's two pieces. One or maybe three pieces. One is regular exercise is great for the most part. How do we do that in a way that's safe and culturally sort of appropriate and responsive? Again, for some, based on, uh, for example, how gender is socialized, there may be kids coming from contexts where, for example, maybe women aren't commonly out playing sports or going for a run or some of the clothes that are commonly worn, for example, in the United States are not commonly worn. Um, so sort of thinking about those pieces. Um, the second piece is, for me, uh, youth sports at its core is around um, belongingness and, and building sort of other pieces. Most kids don't end up becoming a professional anything, um, or they become professional athletes. They don't end up becoming a professional athlete. And even if they do become a professional athlete, um, folks are having to reinvent their careers in their 30s or 40s. So even if you're one of the most successful professional athletes in the world, you'll likely have another career. Um, and so trying to figure out how do we help kids experience a sense of belongingness in their context. So whether it's on the baseball team, basketball team, soccer team, running group, any way that kids can be getting some amount of physical exercise and then participating and feeling like they belong, whether that's everyone gets a jersey or people just are consistently showing up for practice and the coach knows their name, things like this have a huge impact on teenagers in general um, and for, for kids of refugee and immigrant backgrounds who may have had not had the opportunity to participate in, in a team or something like that, it can, be, it can be really impactful. The other layer, these things are complicated, is that school sports or after school activities uh, is a luxury. And for kids who may be in a context where they need to be going home to supporting other siblings or supporting other members of their family or need to are, are working after school uh, and either using that those resources for their family where they're living or sending resources. Um, that's a common thing that, for example, for, for adolescent programming in particular, folks need to think about about like, okay, if I'm asking this kid to be on the soccer team, but they're they also work 20 hours a week. And if you're maybe if you're in a school where there's some kids of a refugee immigrant background and some kids who um, have uh, may have other different types of resources need to sort of think how can we help engage and support uh, support all kids so that way they can fully engage and again there may be kids of refugee immigrant backgrounds who have have uh, more maybe more uh, financial resources at home and so they be different um, but just trying to attend to those things and i imagine um by the time you're getting to middle school or high school young people participating in sports even that are part of a public school system have had other could have had other opportunities earlier to hone their skill and be more likely to play those sports. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in a you know it could be an in, in a less formal context. So mm -hmm. they're playing in their neighborhood or they're mm -hmm. playing um, on the weekends. Just different ways. You know, for me, if you go down to these foundational sort of active ingredients of you know, if getting kids regular, safe exercise. Again, if a kid lives in a community where there's a lot of 
for example, community violence, and they're saying, oh, you should go out for a run when the sun is setting because that's when you're available, that's not necessarily going to be the most effective. So think about how do we help kids get regular exercise and then how do we help them facilitate a sense of belongingness? Obviously, there's, there's lots of other important factors, but those are two. Um, and trying to put those pieces together or work collaboratively with the kid, with the family, with the school, uh, and then anchoring those as, you know, why participating in those things are in the kid's best interest or the family's best interest, as opposed to you saying, it's good to get exercise, which often doesn't, uh, isn't necessarily the most effective change strategy. Thank you. <clears throat> so any thoughts or experiences working with LGBTQ plus teens and young teen mothers of refugee community, um, in refugee communities and um, supporting them in accessing mental health services? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, those are two separate communities with, um, with distinct needs. I, I imagine maybe in the qu question to make a guess, those are both community in terms of LGBTQ youth and then um, uh, sort of adolescents who are in a pregnancy context are, are often underserved. And there's some level in various communities related to stigma of their identity or experience or circumstance. And so, I think for me, maybe the first thing that I would be thinking about is how do we uh, engage and support uh, folks where they're at um, with services that feel meaningful for them, um, as opposed to coming in and saying, this is what you need to do or don't do. Um, I imagine for, for both of these contexts, in terms of my experience supporting folks, uh, there can often be some amount of um, secrecy or some amount of um, sort of containment of identity or experience. And that may come from a place of uh, fear and, and, and concern not only about fear, but around um, how it will re be received by an entire community. You know, if I come out as this particular identity or reveal this particular um, experience that I'm in, how will I, how will I be received? And again, many, you know, adolescents in that context are, are navigating that. And so for us as healthcare providers or educators, trying to co-voyage and um, create a space of safety for kids um, to try to navigate that. It really depends. Th these issues are so culture specific in terms of how something like uh, uh, pregnancy of a 16 year old is, is treated, you know, and that you can imagine a whole range of how that could be received or experienced. And then in the same thing with regard to um, a kid's sexual or gender identity and, and how that could be received, um, but really trying to, um, support kids where they're at, uh, provide um, sort of education and validation where necessary, co-learning together, uh, and then really trying to facilitate um, safety as much as possible. Thank you. Well, those are the end of our questions that were submitted, but I will ask you one final question, which is, is there anything else that you think would be important for folks working with immigrant and refugee refugee youth to consider that we haven't covered? Yeah, and I know, thanks so much, Ellen, for the opportunity to connect with folks. And again, if anyone's watching this and you're interested in these ideas, you can uh, find our information. Um, our group's called the Trauma and Community Resilience Center at Boston Children's Hospital. So you can email me or reach out to us. And, you know, I think a lot, the, there's a lot of key, uh, key ideas. I think one that's time and time again, that comes up for me is, uh, you know, trust takes time and, you know, building genuine community partnerships and relationships is, um, is an incredibly valuable and significant undertaking. And if you want to try to provide mental health services for communities, whether it be your community or other communities, in a way that feels meaningful, trying to build genuine partnerships uh, with stakeholders, with the folks who are already doing this work. If Again, if you're a, like me, if I'm a psychologist trying to go into a community, trying to say like, who is already, you know, how do people in this community heal when they're, they're hurt or when they're suffering? What do people do? Where do they go? How do they talk about that? And rather than someone coming in saying, this is how you do it, Again, coming in, you may have ideas, but really trying to do that listening and learning first and building those relationships so that are not overly transactional, but more really want to be helpful in a genuine way and learn from, from you all about what you do. Again, not in a way that's overly sort of colonizing of telling people like, teach me about you, but more 
let's let's uh, let's learn together. So I, if I have some value to add, I can try to do that, and then building from there. And again, these continuous feedback loops um, and getting trying to elevate voices of kids and communities. And I think that's if you set that as a base, um, that's a really uh, strong uh, strong place to start. Well, thank you. That was uh, certainly a helpful and inspiring answer. I'm sure for folks that are listening and thinking about what steps they can take to uh, begin to better serve these communities. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, my pleasure. So those are all the questions that we have. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Winner, for coming together to answer these final questions and for your work um, in your com the communities that you work in. We so appreciate uh, what you do. Thanks to those of you that have uh, listened to this conversation. Stay tuned um, to AHI's social media channels for more conference updates. And don't forget to save the date for the eighth annual conference on adolescent health on May 12th and 13th of 2022.